Uh, broad sweep, they felt like three really good games. Three contests, a uh, certain ambition to the rugby, you know, the, the, the Six Nations explodes to life and is as um, vibrant as ever for all the history. It's never become dated. Yeah, Ireland were probably in the most boring match because it was the one that was looked well decided long before the end, but we'll take that yes. every time. You had but, your opening line written, I'd say, after 20 minutes, did you? Well, no, no, I'm not that good, no, but anyway... Um, but yeah, it helps when, when an Irish team goes 27-3 up after 27 minutes, all right, yeah. you can start typing. Did the stadium go very quiet? Very, it was Did beautiful. It, yeah. it went quiet long before the 27 minutes. It was quiet after about five or six minutes, after the first try. After the second try, you could hear conversations, you know, a bit of murmuring. It was a be- roof closed, and all, all it was the, just an, e- an echo of a murmur around. There was no, it was a beautiful sound. You, this told you that the away team was winning, yeah. and well. So it was a stunning start, and yeah, I, thought you're, I think you're right. I think all three games were really entertaining. I the, the, the brand of rugby that Scotland played and the tries they scored was thrilling. I think the way Italy put it up to France was, I think it was all unexpectedly good. It was better than I thought it was going to be. I thought there were three pretty entertaining games. Yeah. First time ever, three away wins in the opening weekend and all with bonus points. I heard somewhere uh, last Thursday I was at a, a data, sports data kind of analysis event and I think this stat, by recollection, was... Um, 75% of all home games are a win. The home team win in the Six Nations over the last 20 years, which I didn't realise was that high. Yeah. But yeah, so it goes to show what an exciting opening weekend it was. Mm. And would you agree that the brand of rugby was up your street? Yes, yes. I am falling in love with rugby all over again. Okay. Um, where I wonder why it's three, happening. Four, is it the bonus point? Is it something else? <clears throat> no, I think it's happening because um, the the level of um, coaching is more creative. It's more empowering. But there's a there's a process and a structure to it that is. If I look at if we look at Ireland, w- one of the things that stood out for me in that first twenty seven minutes was a moment where it looked like we were going to concede. It was. Sexton had it from from a midfield rook. He had uh, Hansen running one angle. He had James Lowe outside him running an opposite angle. If you can imagine like a scissors or an X shape. Both of them were running into space either side of a defender and Sexton just had to make the right decision. But the, the Welsh tight head panicked because there was three things on. He didn't know what to do so he shot out and he actually made a good read even though he could have been caught. But he got a hand on Sexton. The, the pass went to deck and Dyer kicked on and Hugo Keane chariots of fire style. You know the way he <laughs> runs? You know, ever see that? He reminds me of every time running down the beach. But he comes, slides in and, and stops. It was that moment, I, there was a freeze frame shot of Sexton about to release the pass to two wingers in midfield running at space. There was, there was Sexton had an option too. That is... The foundations of that are so strong. There's every time we're in attack like that, there's there's a ball carrier has two options. And that's almost every single time we have possession. The level of work rate, the level of insight and planning, the, the selflessness of it within the team. And I the the um Phil Jackson had this idea as as the Bulls and Lakers coach, the eleven rings triangles, it was all about triangles in attack Johan Cruyff had it um, Arteta has it now Guardiola has it, these passing in triangles, you set up a, a three way process where there's always two options for the guy in possession, you end up having this incredibly subtle and brilliant attack that's very hard to stop but it's also very hard to implement Yeah, and you're seeing more and more of that now across other teams hence the throwaway comment I'm falling in love with rugby again because you're seeing Defence is less dominant, mm. brilliant attacks, brilliant tries, more offloads. It's much more fun to watch, but it's not by accident. I think the level of coaching has gone up. Mm. I also think it's about being better refereed. Yeah. They're, they're making better use of the TMO now. It's not as, there aren't as many long delays while they're, restud- while they're studying things. They might be getting one or two things more wrong as a result, such as that knock-on when Sexton was tackled. Yeah. But the game's going at a f- smoother tempo. Yeah. Um, I think it's, uh, it's good for the game that they are trying to quicken it up and it's not, it's not as possible for teams to just slow it down to a crawl. 
like the Springboks do, which I don't think is a great ad. For we all saw the Springboks Lions matches, as as Ian Morgan once said to me, I don't know why we put the third test on the tear your car park after the crimes to rugby in the first two tests. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was a bit. That's where we were two years ago. Yeah. yeah. And look at it now, the difference. And I think there's also a brilliant new breed of younger players coming up. I mean, we're seeing it with the uh, the Irish forwards like Dan Sheen and Caelan Doris, yeah. this new breed of rugby player. And you look at the under twenties, the rugby they played, and big six foot six locks throwing offloads and tip ons, and yeah, it was absolutely. just. So, and then you see somebody like Andrew Capuzzo come through for Italy. It's just a nice new breed of player. Yeah. And Finn Russell's still a joy, and the game's suiting him as well. It's, there's Dar Darcy wrote an article, I think it was today in the Irish Times, saying it, it looks like rugby, it's tipped the balance now in favour of, like, the refereeing is getting better. There's less delays in the game, less pedantic mm -hmm. around decisions, but the actual standard of execution and attack has really elevated and defensive coaches and defensive systems are sweating again. Yes. That's what, that, what, that is what's making that opening weekend so much fun. And also, yeah. three of the top five sides in the world are now in, uh, in the Six Nations. But I know uh, the top two are meeting next Saturday. I doubt that's ever happened before. And I was interviewing Jamie Heasel last week about Caelan Doris just putting where Doris is in the pantheon of modern number eights. And he says, probably the best because he's playing in a tougher hemisphere at the moment. He actually thinks... The Northern Hemisphere is now better than the Southern Hemisphere, and the world ranking was almost, it certainly caught up. Mm. It did help that the weather was ideal for all three matches. Mm. That, al that always helps. But yeah, overall, it's, it's, I also think it's been, you don't want to shout some, from the rooftops too much after just one weekend, but it, does, it did fairly reflect pretty well in the URC. Certainly the Irish performance, the Scottish performance, the Italian performance, and that's been, that's been a trend in the Champions Cup as well. So I think there's an element of that in it as well. I think that... As you were um, talking there about the fact that it was Lowe and Hansen in off their wings, one of the first things you remember Andy Farrell said was, I want messy wingers. Mm. You know, it's not two centres running crisscross, it's wingers coming right in off the wing. That was something from minute one he was encouraging. And uh, the 20s, I told you, I was just going to mention the 20s, Jerry. And Matt was uh, even saying in studio, as we, as we watched, pretty much every player be able to throw brilliant Sonny Bill style <laughs> offloads. I know Sam Brender gets, gets got the shout out, but I mean, it was right across that game. And, and Matt was making the point too, saying, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we weren't coaching offloads really. Mm -hmm. But now all of these young players are running in tackle bags and getting their hands free and throwing offloads. So the skill set is coming up. And, and you think how rugby went, the first thing in that, that, you know, the early 2000s that was sorted out was, well, let's get the rugby league defence coaches mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And that was the real focus. Mm -hmm. It was that dark period where we were saying, do we need to go 13 aside? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that the answer for rugby? And now maybe we're in the wave. All the factors you rightly mentioned are catching up. And also, when all those rugby league coaches came in, there was an emphasis on the higher hit to stop the offload. Yeah. That, was, that came from rugby league. And maybe now with the World Rugby campaign and coaches gradually becoming a little bit more aware and players of the need to keep hits down, that is making it more possible, more yeah. feasible for players to offload as well. So it's it, in making the game safer, it's also making the game more enjoyable to watch. I, yeah. think, I think Farrell has a way of, a way with words, uh, you know, he's making it sound like a simplification, really. You know, I want messy wingers is, it's a nice way of saying he wants greater involvement, but it's not, it's not shapeless chaotic rubbish where the winger is coming in at the wrong time that that was very very clearly set up yes they they knew they had to be there I think the differentiating factor with this group versus when and I would have been openly critical of the Schmidt era there was lots of process stuff that was good but then it became too process driven there's lots of process stuff here but there's always options within the process and they're genuine options where I think they paid lip service to that in the past. It was like, everyone's got an option. They didn't. You don't really have an option because if you get it wrong, you're a dead man. Mm. That's the way it used to work. Mm. Now it's like there are two genuine options every time. They set it up in midfield so often in that first 20 minutes because that splits the Welsh defence and it eliminates their shooter coming out because the shooter, defender, Gatland loves and Edwards, I know he's not involved with Wales anymore, but... They love when the ball is at, an ex at a wide extremity and there's wide passes coming back across the field. That's where the shooter can be really dominant. We got the ball into midfield all the time and then we're going one side to the other. Sexton was pointing fingers, going one side, going to the other. You had guys coming in off the wing, running options. You had Porter handling his first receiver, looking very, very comfortable, but he had two options too. The The... the 
Farrell is canny, you know, and he'll say things like, I want messy wingers, but it, that that's predicated, that's built on yes. eight months of work. A bit like the, the heads of rugby sending Yeah, far it's, too it's a throwaway casual line, but it's that was constructed beautifully for that first 25 okay. minutes. Uh, Jerry, with the view to France, what are your big takeaways from Cardiff? Um, that I think that we might have cons- worried a little bit that November marked a period of not quite stagnation, but that the game hadn't progressed from the highs attack, of New Zealand yeah, in attack. Yeah, yeah. And I thought last Saturday, that first half an hour, was actually a clear signal that the team is going back on an upward graph again and it's still trying to evolve and it's still becoming very potent. There you go. That was just a snippet of Wednesday Night Rugby. I think we did about 45 minutes with Jerry and Andy. Highly recommended. The boys were brilliant throughout, as good as uh, it gets, really. So wherever you get your podcasts, you'll find Wednesday Night Rugby. Andy and Jerry waiting for you.